Tony and Jenny Bruski here from Real Ghost Stories Online. There has never been a better time than now to be an EPP, extra podcast person, to Real Ghost Stories Online. There's more exclusive content than ever before. Plus, our new EPP website is up and running where you can access all of our exclusive content anywhere you want on any device. Exclusive video, all of the archived episodes, it's all there when you sign up to be an EPP at realghoststoriesonline.com. It's only $5 a month. And that goes to keeping our show on the air and alive. Sign up now, become an EPP, and enjoy all of the bonus episodes for yourself when you sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com. Just click Become an EPP. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802. Or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And welcome to my birthday episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. This show is airing on my birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. We're recording it a couple days before, so I still have a little bit of time before I get a little <laughs> bit older. But Just a plug there. Because it is my birthday... I can do anything I want today. Oh, God. And let's just kill the spooky music right now. It's time to talk about quiche. All right? Full, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> That'd be hell. No. I, don't, I don't think I could. Anyhow. Good stories today, it looks like. Uh, out of luck and out of gas, two teens find something comes by and lends a hand. A listener wants to know if our show is causing paranormal events in his life. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that, we don't even read this. It is. That's the answer to that. A woman finds out the hard way that a brand new house may be as haunted as a very old one. And a sleep deprived mother finds herself wide awake after what she sees in the baby monitor. Well, that's creepy. Just a little. I Is that why we never really used our, like, uh, that nice video one that I got? I mean, she was just right across the hall. So she was we, across we, the hall. We could hear her just fine. Yeah. But I bought that one, and I thought this would be neat. And you, as soon as you found out we were expecting, that was the like the next day you bought that. I did. Yeah. Because I'd never. This was my first time going through that, so yeah. I'm like, well, what? What do I do? I know. Let's get a baby monitor. <laughs> that seems to be an appropriate <laughs> preparation. Uh huh. You know, I just I was trying to help. Yeah. But uh, I remember we ended up using it like when it stormed. Mm-hmm. Like we were down in our storm shelter a couple times, and I'm like, well. We could use it for this. So I like I set it up facing out the windows upstairs so we could see outside when we were in our storm shelter. And it was such a shitty picture. You couldn't tell anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ended up giving it to like uh, like the DAV or something. You know, I mean, audio worked fine as a yeah. baby monitor. But as far as a, uh, a picture, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure somebody found good use for it uh, for the audio portion. But anyhow, that would be very creepy to watch a baby mo- monitor and see. Uh, something in it. Yes. I can't imagine. So uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number to call in your Real Ghost Stories. Here to Real Ghost Stories online, as you well know. Of course, you can also write it on the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. Lots of ways to get your stories uh, in to us here as we broadcast live from a booth at a Red Lobster here on my birthday. Yes, more Cheddar Bay biscuits, please. Please. Do you want more? Are you good with more? I don't eat those. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun to do our show from a booth at a Red Lobster? That would be so weird. They're just who are those? What are those people doing over there? That's that's a little <laughs> odd. I say that because on my birthday every year, like since I was I don't know like five, mm-hmm. it was always like we go to Red Lobster. It's like the restaurant I always picked, and still to this day, I'm still quite I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the Red Lobster, not quite the same as it used to be, uh, but it's still uh, the, you go for the biscuits. Yeah. And and that's really about it. And then they, go ahead. I was going to say, I used to go before they even had biscuits. I, I, I think I was there, but I don't remember those days. Like back in the 80s, they didn't even have the biscuits. I think I may have actually blocked those memories out of my mind because they were so traumatic not having the biscuits. Okay. <laughs> possible it's very possible anything is possible we're going to kick off the show today with a uh, letter here from rob and rob brightson hello tony and jenny love the show and i think what you guys are doing is wonderful providing a place for people to share their experience without judgment now i've believed in the paranormal pretty much my entire life as my mother was sensitive i was always very open 
about discussing the subject. Though I do try to look at things rationally and try to find a reasonable explanation first, I've had many experiences that just could not be explained. I do believe in ghosts or human entities, if you will, and other types of entities. Things that we term inhuman spirits that are basically entities that never lived as a human being. Among the second category, I think there are dark creatures, demons, or whatever else you may wish to call them. But also there are lighter entities that people may call angels or guardian spirits, etc. The story I'd like to share today is an encounter that myself and a friend of mine had with what we believe to have possibly been some type of guardian spirits. This happened about 20 years ago now. In fact, I believe it was during the summer of 95. Myself, my mother, and a close friend of mine named Jim had decided to take a summer road trip. It was not the first and not the last long road trip that Jim and I had taken together. I don't remember where we had gone this particular summer anymore, but as that does not affect the story, I'll let that be. We were on the last leg of our return journey and were, I believe, just a couple of hours from home on what had been a rather long road journey. We were on the expressway and had been making good time when Jim, who was driving, noticed that he was losing power and speed. He quickly realized that this was because we were running on empty, and it was obvious that the vehicle was going to be doing nothing but coasting in a moment, if that. As luck would have it, if we were on an off-ramp at which there was a sign for gas, so Jim was able to get us onto the off-ramp, which was a slight gray downhill, just as the engine sputtered and gave out, having burned the last fuels of f uh, fumes of fuel. We were in the past. I was. We were in a passenger van that could seat up to ten people, so it was a fairly major vehicle. Still, though, a little bit of momentum we gained from the downgrade on the ramp only took us out into the major roadway that it emptied out into. So there we were, in the middle of the road with traffic passing by us about 40 yards in the driveway to the gas station. So we put the van in neutral and Jim and I got out to push while my mother steered. We began to push, putting our backs into it, but like I said, this was not a small vehicle. I was wondering how my short and stubby self and tall drink of water that was Jim were going to move this vehicle alone to a parking lot or at least out of traffic enough so we could buy a can of gas. When I noticed another set of hands beside me, suddenly there were two men helping us, one to my right and one to Jim's left, helping us push. We got the van into the station lot. They even helped push it close enough to be able to use one of the pumps. Jim and I turned to thank them very gratefully for the help, and they were both gone. Now, I should explain that there's nothing else near the station, no other buildings or anything, and this was in the middle of a bright and sunny day. Yet in a couple of seconds that it took us to turn our heads, they were both nowhere to be seen. It was then that we realized that we had never noticed where the two men had come from. There were no other people about and no other buildings for them to have come from or gone into other than the small gas station store, which they could not have reached without our, us seeing them. There were no stopped cars where they could have come from. Jim and I exchanged looks and then asked my mother, who was then getting out of the van, if she had seen where the two men had gone. What men, she asked. The two men who helped us push the van out of the road, I said. She just looked at us strange and said that she hadn't seen anyone else behind the van, just us. Helpful spirits that just happened by? Guardian spirit sent to us in a time of need. I know what I believe. I know it's not as impressive as some stories, but for me, it holds a special place. Thank you for reading my story. I'll send more when I have a chance. Keep up the great work, you two. Rob. I, I think they were good spirits. I'm not sure that they were angels, but maybe just helpful ghosts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really neat that they came and they helped move the van at the time that they did. And, you know, I think if you hadn't just turned around and they weren't there, you wouldn't have thought anything of it. Or even, like, noticed? Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they were, you thought you guys were pushing the van. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that there are spirits that inhabit, like, specific areas, if you will. And they're not necessarily guardian spirits, but they're just there so i think at times when they can step in and do something of good they do mm -hmm. not necessarily 
you know, the, the guardian angel type thing that's always following you and always trying to keep you out of harm, but just some spirits that are just in a certain area, in the right place, right time. Okay, let's go help these people. It's yeah. something we are capable of doing. Uh, if they are, they are. And it certainly sounds like in this case, they were. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. It'd be interesting, uh, you know, if that were to happen today, because, I mean, in this day and age, there's, you know, security cameras on everything and everywhere. And I would almost imagine that there'd be a gas station security camera that would be able, you could look at today. But being this was like 95 or so, probably didn't exist. Yeah. But for just for situations like this, where you can go back like, and go to the gas station, can you look at your camera and just, I don't know where these men went. They really helped us out. I just want to make sure, you know, just see where, where they went. Maybe we can, you know, determine who they were and thank them. Mm -hmm. You know, don't go to the gas station. Going, I think two ghosts just helped me move my car, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, well, why not? And then when there's no one there, the gas station attendant will think you're crazy. But hey. <laughs> I think you'd have better luck getting the gas station attendant to help you if you went in and said, I think I just saw two ghosts. Can we look at your camera? And I think that's where a lot of gas station attendants would go. I have a gun behind the counter. You are aware of that, correct? <laughs> I don't know. I think they'd be more interested if you approached it that way. You're probably right. I think it really depends on the gas station attendant mm -hmm. and what kind of mood they're in that day. Because they, they, they probably deal with a lot of, of you know, winners. Yeah. Throughout the day. They just may not be in the mood at a certain point. But that is a very interesting story. Thank you for, for writing that in and sharing that uh, that with us. Our number, of course, 855-853-4802. You can also write it on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. And be sure to press subscribe on whatever platform it is you listen to our show on. It's out there on a lot of them these days. iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, uh, Spotify, uh, TuneIn Radio, Blog Talk Radio. Uh, there's a lot of places mm -hmm. you can listen to our show at. And when you press subscribe, the latest episodes come to you just like that. You don't have to single time. Helps you out, helps us uh, grow in those uh, rankings and ratings. So it's a win-win for everybody. Roderick writes in, I guess you could say that this story is more of a question than it is a story. I believe that your show is haunted or attracts spirits while listening. At first, I thought it was just my imagination getting to my head, but there have been instances when paranormal activity has happened while listening to your show. Don't get me wrong, I love this show and I listen every day and I'm an EPP and will continue to be one. But it gets scary when things get a little too real. It's only happened a few times, but a few times it did happen. It was terrifying. For the most part, I listen at night when I'm driving to see my girlfriend who lives about an hour and some change away from me or when I'm at work sitting at my desk. I've had incidents happen to me in both places. The first incident took place when I was driving to see my girlfriend and I was listening to the podcast with Richard in Chattanooga played in chronological order. The more I listened, the more I could feel myself getting scared and then when that disembodied wind started to play during his phone call, I had a big urge to look in my back seat momentarily. In the rear passenger seat, I could see a small, faint black mist taking the shape of a person sitting down in my car. The mist looked almost like it was a swarm of gnats coming together. The weird part was it looked like wind moving around the sound of the disembodied whistling. I immediately pulled over, turned on my e-lights, and got out of my car. I was so shaken up that I needed to have a smoke and spent about 10 minutes convincing myself that I was just seeing things. I couldn't finish the episode because I was too afraid and I ended up finishing it the next morning. But that whole drive to my girlfriend's house was so eerie. It felt like it was watching me and it was literally getting stronger from my fear. The most recent experience happened at work last week and I was listening to EPP episode 44, I think, and it was titled The Graveyard Shift. While listening to that episode, that feeling of fear and uneasiness came back. I started looking around the office hoping someone else was there, but it just it was just me. As I listened intently to the story, which was a great one by the way, I had a feeling that I was being watched again. Just like last time, that feeling began to manifest itself. While you both were commenting on the story about the graveyard shift, I heard crystal clear in my earbuds a loud whisper in a raspy male voice said, Hi there. I yelled, what the fuck? And damn near fell off my chair and threw my earbuds to the ground. Needless to say, I didn't finish that EPP episode that afternoon in the office. Hi there, as if it 
who are acknowledging my fear and trying to make it worse. Well, with that said, here's my question, but first, my theory. Ghost, human or inhuman, are attracted to fear like sharks and are attracted to, like sharks are attracted to blood in the water. The incidents only take place when I'm frightened and alone. I think ghosts have the supernatural ability to use fear, a source of energy, to either manifest or make its presence known. What do you guys think? Do you think this could actually happen or is this all in my head? Is my fear calling ghosts over or am I just listening a little too hard? Let me know, guys, and keep up the good work. Even though I get scared from time to time by your podcast, I'm hooked and look forward to more. Take care. I'm not going to say it's all in your head, but what I will say is that I, I think it's the phenomenon of being more in tune to things going on when you're in that mindset. Okay. And it could be a combination of that plus any fear that you're feeling hearing the stories that mm -hmm. do maybe attract different things, but it's not, oh, if you listen to that show, you're going to be haunted. Sure. Kind of thing. It's it's more of a combination. It, it's, it's like an atmosphere that's created that has to be just so for things to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, to add to that, if you're someone who's more in tune and more sensitive to things, you're more likely to have things happen to you. Yes. So, um, can the show, you know, does the show bring up uh, things? I don't know. I mean, I, I would, I would think that, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's tons and tons of, of paranormal content out there from, uh, you know, television and all those ghost hunting shows and everything. Um, you know, I, I would think that there would be more instances of that, of just discussing the topic and then things actually happening. If that were a regular thing. Yes. Or a common thing to happen. Now, I will say this. Uh, this is not the first person to say that something odd happened to them when they heard that weird whistling sound. Yes. On the Richard episode. We've been hearing that since we aired the original Richard episode, probably about a year ago now. Um, and there were people saying they felt ill, they felt sick, uh, when they heard that sound. Now, I mean, could some of that be psychological? You're listening to the story that's supposedly about demons and this and that. Could it affect you if you think you are actually hearing this thing manifesting itself? Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, but at the same point, we got multiple letters in from multiple people after airing that episode the first time and before we even talked about it again on the air all saying the same thing yeah so it wasn't like hey let's suggest this on the air let's just say hey we got a letter people said they were feeling sick when hearing that sound uh no like before we even said that on the air that people were feeling that way we got letters saying that mm -hmm. so this is i think the the only one we've ever gotten that said that there was like some sort of manifestation that i think this one goes a little bit further than any of the other ones but but not the first person to say they were affected by that I feel nothing when I hear that sound. Do you feel anything? I mean, I feel, it sounds creepy. I it sounds creepy. And the only thing when I heard it the first time, I looked over at you because I thought, what was that? Mm -hmm. That was my, my feeling. That did not strike me as just wind. Um, yeah. But it didn't affect me physically. I And the first time I heard it, I thought it was, he was like standing by his patio door. Because that's kind of, I mean, it does, it reminiscently sounds like, you know, a windy day and you open up your patio door and the pressure and the wind coming in and out. And yeah, that's, and it, it comes and it goes and it comes at a very key point in his conversation, which was interesting mm -hmm. looking back on it when we did, I did the, the review of the Richard uh, a couple months ago now in an episode. I, I listened to that again and it was interesting, and I, I can't recall exactly what he was speaking of, but it does come in play at a very specific point in the story where it, it makes it even more eerie. Mm -hmm. So, which is something that I, I don't know that we picked up on the first time, but uh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting take. I mean, if anyone else has, has things that happen to them when listening to the show, we'd love to hear it. It'd be an interesting thread up on our message board on our website. Just click on the forum section at realghoststoriesonline.com and uh, you know, share your stories. You can interact with other listeners as well who may have had something uh, paranormal happen to them while listening. DD writes in, My first experience began when I was five. I lived with my mom and sister, who's about 
five and a half years older than me. My sister and I were really close to our next door neighbor. It was a man, his son and daughter. Well, one night my sister and I were spending some time with the girl as her dad was working overnights and the brother was spending the night with some friends. The girl, Melissa, had pulled out a Ouija board and asked us if we wanted to play. We were intrigued as we both shook our heads yes. She read the rules and weren't all that hesitant to play this game, being five. I thought it was like any other kid game and my sister didn't really believe in all that spirit stuff. Well, as we began placing our hands on the planchette, we asked if anyone was there. It took about a few minutes as the pointer was rocking back and forth. We asked again if anyone was there. The pointer landed on the word yes. It then decided to spell out J-O-H-N. We asked, do you know who we are? It quickly pointed to yes. We got nervous and threw our hands off the pointer. We began blaming each other, saying, no, you're doing this, Melissa. And her being flustered, she said, no, it was you, Amanda, my sister. Then, of course, me being the littlest one, they blamed me and said, I said it wasn't me. Well, we grabbed our bearings and continued on. We asked if John was still there. It took a few minutes as it began slowly moving and pointing to yes. We asked if he was my sister and I's uncle. Pointer pointed to yes. and We said, if this is you, could you spell out how you died? It first spelled out F-I-R. My sister and I swallowed that knot that seemed to be stuck in our throats, and we asked him if he was okay. And he was there with little John, which was my aunt's son who had died at birth. The pointer said yes. After that, we decided that it was enough and finished the steps to close the gateway to the spirit world. We got a little freaked out and decided to explain the story to Melissa, told her how he had passed and what his name was, and then we finished telling her about what happened to my aunt's son that had passed. Ever since that night, I've never touched a Ouija board, but I've had plenty of paranormal experiences throughout my life. Would love to share more of them as time goes on. Thanks for rocking the show, and thanks for letting me share. Okay, this this particular story isn't too much unlike other Ouija board stories that we've had, but what I want to talk about is that I think other things have knowledge of those who you're related to that have died and they sure. can pretend to be that mm -hmm. and you just never really know if it's really that lost family member friend whoever or if it's something pretending to be that and I think that's something that we don't talk a lot about as far as pretending, something pretending to do that. Mm -hmm. We always talk about, you never know what you're going to get. But, you know, in this case, I'm sure she was pretty certain who that was. But you can never be really certain. She thought she was pretty certain. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah, that, that kind of comes into the, you never know what you're going to get. And that really pertains to that, mm -hmm. that very thought of, you think you're getting one thing but you could very likely be getting another. And that's the scary part with that. You yeah. know, it, you're never really going to be sure if you're communicating with that loved one or something else trying to get your attention and play on your emotions. Because if if you have a loved one who's passed on and you suddenly think, oh my God, I'm really communicating with them. They know these things that no one else knows. It has to be them. It doesn't have to be them. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it really doesn't. And that's, that's the scary part. But I mean, I... It's, it's you be you know human nature to to go well it's worth it to try it just in case if it is mm -hmm. you know and unfortunately that's where there's a lot of stories that we end up getting in about Ouija boards where it's like and I thought it was so and so but uh, yeah it turned out it wasn't or, or or we had the conversation and uh, you know we ended the conversation and I didn't think anything of it and then all of a sudden all this other thing started happening yeah that weren't connected or they didn't think was connected but it really probably wasn't their loved one. Mm -hmm. So scary proposition. That's why it's uh, just say no <laughs> with Ouija Awareness Month. Yeah. <laughs> never know what you're going to get. Brenda writes in, I am a new listener and I really enjoy your episodes. I've had many strange paranormal experiences, but I'll just share those from one location from now because this home was the awakening for me, so to speak, of the paranormal world and started my kind of ghost hunting hobby. Warning, this is a long story. This location is my sister's home. 
from for one uh, for one thing it taught me that a haunting is not always necessarily connected to an establishment but rather an area her home was not the old creepy house down the lane it was new and we had visited the home while it and the neighborhood was still under construction the house has three rooms my niece's room the master bedroom and the safe room as i like to call it the very first experience i had happened around one in the morning i'd been chatting with a friend of mine online when i decided to go to bed my mom was going through some financial trouble and so we both moved in we stayed in the safe room that night my second niece slept with my mom and so it took the cousin uh, so i took the couch in the living room I know what you all might be thinking. Young girl goes to sleep late, there being a definite possibility that the following happenings could have been a dream. All these years that have passed, I know that I was awake. But I do understand that all I can give is my word and my fear. Anyways, I lay on the couch and snuggled under those fake mink blankets. Not more than a minute later, I heard shuffling coming from the area in front of me. I hadn't even had time to close my eyes yet. When I looked towards the noise, there was nothing. I also have to point out that, with the exceptions of the bedrooms, the house had tile floors. Walking, especially bare feet walking on tile, is very distinct. When I saw that there was nothing, I figured it was my imagination. Then, as I began to close my eyes, I heard someone walking right towards me with a quick pace. My eyes opened wide, and in fear, I wrapped the blanket around my head, my right arm protruding out, trying to hold my blanket cocoon together. I listened carefully for the noise, but there was nothing. Then suddenly, I felt a strong hand grab my right arm firmly. So much so, that when I looked down, I could see finger marks on the blanket covering me. I shot up and became paralyzed. My eyes searched everywhere, seeing nothing. But I could not bring myself to run or scream. I just sat there crying silently. When I finally felt calm, I sprinted to my mom and told her what had happened. I cried myself to sleep that night. The second experience I had in that house was years later when my sister and her family went on vacation. My dad and I told her we'd stay to look over the house while they were gone. My dad took the master bedroom while I took my niece's room, which at the time was the office. For the use of the computer... I, being a weird teenager, took a sleeping bag into the room. I planned to stay up as long as possible playing on the computer. When I finally lay to sleep again, before I could close my eyes, I heard shuffling on the carpet. This time the shuffling kept moving as if the entity was circling around my body. I was so frightened I left the room and slept in the safe room. The next morning I woke up to the sound of typing from the office. I thought my dad might be on the computer and so I called out to him. No answer from him, I got up and walked to the office. As I approached the room, I heard the keyboard slide back into the computer desk and the shuffling again. I peered into the room to find no one inside. I then heard the sound of someone running barefoot go past me, running on the tile down the hall until the sound just stopped. I ran outside with the dogs who did not return into the house until my dad came back to the house later that morning. Another incident happened once again at night while I was on the computer. This time in the dining room while surfing the web, I heard a whisper and thought I could not make out the word. Though I could not make out the words, I felt the urge to turn towards the living room. When I looked, I saw a tall black shadow. For whatever reason, my response was to look back at the computer screen and just close my eyes. There are many other stories from my family members on this house. My eldest niece when she was still a toddler, refused to sit in the recliner that my dad had left because she claimed there was always a black man in it. I tend to connect this with the shadow figure I saw and the hand grabbing my arm for the amount of strength of the grip. My second niece was born shortly after my sister had moved in. She would sleep in between her and her husband at night, and for weeks they said she would stare up at the ceiling at something. Whatever she saw would scare her so badly that she, as an infant, would cry and hide herself within their arms. After a period of time, our family eventually did a blessing on her, which seemed to help. My mom even confused my oldest niece for what my sister referred to as the little girl in our house. I believe in the paranormal, and I personally, and I personally believe this house, too, to be haunted. I believe that there are at least two spirits in the house, the shadow man and the little girl. And I also 
find that the most active rooms are my niece's room and the master bedroom. For the years I have known this house, I feel the safest in the safe room, thus the name. I have many more paranormal experiences I could share, but this entry was already extremely long. Thank you. It's interesting that a haunting can take place in just certain rooms mm -hmm. of a home. It makes you wonder if there was something there previously that occupied the footprint of where those two rooms are, but not the rest of the house. Or if there was like some sort of blessing done mm -hmm. only to the one room, yeah. you know, or there's some reason why whatever it is would not go in there, mm -hmm. maybe in life, yeah, even. So they still don't go there in death. It's very hard to, to know the answer to that, but... They have something that I think most people who are experiencing a haunting would uh, would die to have. I mean, no pun intended. Uh, you know, a escape room, essentially, a safe yeah. room. Because most places or buildings that have a haunting, there's really no place to hide. Mm -hmm. It's just always going to be going on. So, very, very interesting story. Thank you for, for writing that into us. Let's go over to Amy. Amy writes in, Dear Tony and Jenny, hi, from Florida. My name is Amy, and I love your show. I've been listening for about a year, mainly while I'm driving or getting ready for the day. This is my first time sending in an experience. I've always loved reading, watching, and listening to other paranormal adventures. I've had a few experiences myself, but the two I'm writing about are the most questionable ones I have, meaning I just can't explain them away. So here goes my tale. The first time this happened was when my family was living in Alabama. We were renting a house that was about three years old, so not too old or spooky at all. The house was a split floor plan with the master bedroom being on the side of the house with the kitchen and garage area and the remaining three bedrooms on the other side of the house in their own hallway. It was late at night, about 10.30 or so. I put my youngest, who was still a baby, to bed in his crib about a half hour before. My husband was in the kitchen making his lunch for the next day and I was getting settled in bed. At this time, the baby was not, asleep, was not sleep trained and we had purchased a video baby monitor so that we could tell if he was truly up at night or just stirring. While I was waiting for my husband, I heard the baby start to cry over the monitor. I waited a few seconds, he was still fussing and crying, so I picked up the monitor to see if I needed to go in there and see, and see to him. In the monitor, I saw my brother, who was staying with us at the time, walking up to the crib in the baby's room. I rushed across the house to stop him from rousing the baby any further and to explain we were trying to let him calm himself down. When I got to the baby's room, I found the door shut and went inside quietly. Everything was quiet, including the baby, who was soundly sleeping. I walked to the guest room where my brother was staying and asked if he had been in the baby's room just then. He said he had not. I really have no explanation as to why that happened. I know I saw my brother in the monitor screen. He even looked towards the monitor. After that, we bought a non-digital monitor from Walmart. I couldn't bring myself to look into that, look into it at night when the house was dark and still. The second story is similar to the first. This happened about two years later and after we moved to Florida. I was volunteering on an old Navy base. The building we are in happens to be the oldest on base and is reportedly haunted. It has served many purposes since it was built, a hospital, a store, and a newspaper office, to name a few. We have a few assigned parking spaces to the side of the building, but the majority of parking is shared with a survival school located next to us. One of the parking spaces that are assigned is for the director of the local office. At the time, he was driving a small hybrid car, and it was a unique color. So one day, I had gotten to the office and was walking in and noticed that our director was getting out of his car. He said hi in passing and walked in. I usually visit the office manager and full-time counselor when I first arrive, catch up on usual cases or unusual cases or what might have come down from headquarters as I am not in more than a couple days each week. While talking to them, a client had a request that needed to be presented to the director before proceeding onto our headquarters and the staff thought he had not come in yet from a meeting off base. I quickly told them I had just seen him outside and he was back looked at me like it wasn't possible because he had told them he would be in about an hour from then. I suggested they call up to his office because I was sure I saw him outside getting out of his car. So they call and he was in the car on the way back to the office. He had not arrived yet. 
Confused, I said I just saw him. He had on his red company shirt. They suggested that maybe I it was one of the instructors at the school that had a car like the director's. Either way, the director arrived 10 minutes later with a dress shirt instead of the red company shirt I'd seen him in. It's a weird feeling knowing that I saw him get out of his car. Could have touched the car as I walked by it, but here he was standing there, just arrived from that meeting. A few weeks later, I was leaving for the day with one of the staff, and she pointed to the instructor getting into his car. See, he has the same car as him, she stated. I could see very well that the instructor did have the same car, but he would have never parked in the director's spot. It clearly has a sign for him and would not even be convenient for the instructor to park in it as it wasn't close to the school building entrance. So there it is. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are about it. I've heard of doppelgangers and I don't know if that is the name for this. It wasn't a warning of any sort and nothing happened afterwards to anyone involved. Just a weird experience. It's been at least two years since something like this has happened to me and I would be happy to just hear about the experience from others at my own other than my own from now on out Amy you know I think the experience of seeing the supervisor in the parking lot who ended up not really being there mm -hmm. I think that would not have been an impactful occurrence had she not had the baby monitor experience previously sure I think it would have been just, oh, well, guess I saw something. But knowing full well what she saw in the baby monitor and then hearing the baby and then going and checking and everything's fine mm -hmm. and the brother's not even in the room makes you start to question everything you see. She sees living people when they're not there. Yes. It's not I see dead people. It's I see whatever it is. The I mean, it, it's... <sighs> kind of ties into what we were talking about the other day about can someone's thought process or an imagination or just thinking about doing something can that ever manifest as an entity somewhere else you know like with the brother mm -hmm. the brother could have been sitting in that other bedroom thinking ah, if I just go in there and help comfort the baby mm -hmm. and she's seeing this on the monitor when he's never actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Could it be, have been the director uh, driving in his car, thinking of well, when I get to the office and get out of the car, then we go do this. Just a normal, not I'm sitting here focusing, trying to project myself anywhere, just the process going through it. Can that ever actually create itself? Isn't that where we get astral projection? <laughs> kind of, yeah. I'm thinking that's possibly what may be going on in those cases. Mm-hmm. A lot of time with astral projection, you really think about people really focusing on it. Mm -hmm. You know, really, I want to try and do this. You know, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to focus. But this just seems like such passive, Yeah, it's very passive astral projection. Well, and I think a lot of times it happens when people are sleeping. Mm -hmm. So I could see the brother dreaming about going and quieting the baby. Yeah. And that manifesting. But the, the boss in the parking lot, I don't know. That's just kind of random. It makes you wonder how many other dead, or not dead people, but uh, but people she sees mm -hmm. that she never realizes are not really there. Now you're going to make her paranoid. Where there's no conclusion to it. Where it's like, you just see the person. The only reason she recognizes is because she cross-referenced it with the other people. Sure. I bet she sees a lot. Could be. But you never know. And if it's not harmful... There's nothing really bad about that. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. It, it's a, I think it's just an ability that some people have and some people don't have. And I don't I mean, I think it's a natural thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would call it paranormal because we don't know what the hell it is or why some people have it or don't. But I, I just think some people are more sensitive than others and it's totally normal. Could be. That's what, you know, so I don't, I don't think she needs to feel bad about it, but it just, no. It is, it is what it is. So you have more abilities than the rest of us. That's pretty cool. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi. Hi, guys. Um, so I can't really say that I'm like an avid listener of your show. I kind of just found it recently because I've been doing a lot of research um, 
ever since I had this incident happen to me, and uh, I've kind of just been looking for, I don't know, I guess like-minded people. I mean, not, nobody that I really talk to about it believes me or maybe doesn't believe me but thinks that, uh, you know, let me just tell the story and I guess it'll make more sense. Um, so about a year ago, I moved into an apartment with my boyfriend. Um, it was, we had lived together previously at his parents' house. We've been together for a long time, about seven years. And we finally got our own place. Um, so about three or four months ago, we had gotten into an argument. And he left and went over to his parents' house for the night. And they live very nearby. I mean, literally a block away from our apartment complex. So I was laying on the couch and I was watching a movie and uh, kind of drifting off to sleep. I had been on the phone with my cousin and um you know i was pretty relaxed not really worrying about anything or anything like that and i started having this overwhelming feeling that someone was in my house in the back of my house and just to kind of give you a little layout of my apartment um it's a two bedroom it's like a pretty open floor plan um and it's the hallway is very narrow and it would be pretty easy for a person to be in one of those bedrooms and for me to never ever be aware of it um you know, normally my boyfriend would be home, so I wouldn't even think about it. And I kept thinking that I could hear the shuffling of feet on the carpet. And then I was like, that's ridiculous. I have a TV on. How could I hear it over that? So I turned the TV down and listened for a while, and there was nothing. So I just convinced myself that, you know, I was just freaking out. I wasn't, you know, wasn't really used to being there alone. And then it was fine. Um, so a few more minutes passed, and I'm watching TV. And I let out a laugh. I was watching a funny TV show. And I heard a cough. Uh, it was late at night. The floor and the building that I live on is mostly families or older people. So it's not allowed. I mean, people aren't throwing parties. You don't hear people really shuffling around after 11 o'clock at night. Um, so it startled me, and I, I just had this overwhelming sense of panic. I've never really felt anything like it. I was sweating. Uh, my heart was racing. And something just kept telling me, get the hell out of here. Get out leave go uh, but i still the more i guess rational side of me the part that was trying to be rational kept saying you know what there's nothing in here just relax well then i heard a drawer slam so i immediately grabbed my phone ran outside the door and i called my cousin that i had previously been on the phone with and i told her what was going on and she said you know um why don't you call my boyfriend's and his bench so why don't you call ben and uh, tell him to come look or, you know, why don't you just relax or whatever. And she said, just walk back in, turn all the lights on, look around, it'll make you feel better. So I, you know, I felt a little calmer, um, felt like I was just being silly, and she was probably right. So I walked back in, and um, before I could even reach the main light in the hallway, I heard somebody say, I'm going to get her. And I took off. I didn't really know what to do. I took off running. I ran barefoot all the way to my boyfriend's parents' house. I banged on the door. I told him someone was in the house. We had to call the police, you know. And uh, so we did. We called the police, and they met us back over there. They came upstairs, they looked around, and there was no one there. They, of course, were looking at me like I was just some dumb girl, you know, scared to be alone. But... I had spent a lot of time alone. Um, I'm an only child, you know what I mean? My parents both had jobs when I was a kid. I was always alone in my mom's house once I was old enough to be, and I never got scared there, ever, not one time that I can remember. And if I did, it never prompted me to run out of the house screaming at midnight, barefoot, screaming for needing the police. Um, so that's my story. I can't really say that I have much more than that. Um, to call back with or you know like a lot of people that have these experiences often but I guess I'm saying all that to say that either someone was there and they took off or whatever wanted to get me was just something that I couldn't see to begin with so uh, thank you and I really enjoy your show and I will probably continue listening after this and um, yeah thanks Thank you for calling in and sharing your story and that is a very common way of finding our show is kind of looking for like-minded people who may have experienced something uh, paranormal. And if you're a new listener, you probably haven't heard too many stories where we talk about negative energy. 
attracting things. But mm-hmm. if you had had a fight with your husband to the point where he went back to his parents' house, I think that might be enough negative energy for something lurking to go ahead and show itself and come yeah. on out. Yeah. I completely agree. I, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things where when you get that feeling in your gut where she got it, where it's like, I got to get out of here. I should get out of here. You should probably follow that. Always. <laughs> follow that uh, because it sounds like it was it was leading you in the right direction. Um, I mean, obviously, you, you, you got an experience you got to share on our show, but it's one you'll probably also never forget either. Mm-hmm. So follow your gut. Um, the fact that you even had that feeling uh, is is more than a lot of folks right. have when they run into these situations. A lot of times it's, well, I was doing this and all of a sudden I saw this. Yeah. It's it, A lot of times it's not, I got this really weird feeling, you know. Sometimes that's there, but if you got it, follow it. And if it were me, I would have gone ahead and called the police and had them check it wasn't an intruder. Because, yeah, you want to cover your bases and make sure that, you know, it, it isn't human-like. Right. But the fact that all those are kind of those options were narrowed down and it turns out, yeah, probably not so human. But uh, more times than not, it's going to be a human. This is mm-hmm. not a human case. Yeah. So thank you for calling and sharing your, your story with us here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi. Hi, Tony and Jenny. This is Bear Elliott, and I have a story for you. I came across your podcast uh, just recently this week, and I actually spent 30-plus hours of listening to back episodes and just really getting into just your whole phenomenon that you have created with Real Ghost Stories Online. It just really captivated me, and I love that you've set up a paranormal support group. That just is amazing. A little backstory about myself. I have been a paranormal investigator now. Wow. For 20 plus years, I've been investigating all kinds of stuff, and when any of my groups have gone in, we've always gone in with a very scientific look at the paranormal. And we look at EVPs, we look at the uh, carbon monoxide ratings, we look at the electromagnetic fields inside the home. We also look at the individuals themselves as well um, to see if there's any anything that could possibly be leading up to this. Uh, we've had cases in the past where the child was going through a divorce and this is a way for the child to get attention from the parents for imaginary friend goes a little crazy. Well, we go through this and we eliminate all of the science from it. And whatever's left over, we're left scratching our heads going, huh, that's kind of weird. So that's where I come from in a look at the paranormal. I had a story for you guys that I think you'd get a kick out of. It just shows that, you know, once you've passed on to the afterlife, if you decide to hang around here on Earth or if you decide to go to the great beyond, you still retain a sense of self and a sense of a sense of humor. And we were investigating a theater down in Florida. I spent many years living in Florida and we were invited in by a local playhouse that had three different stages. And we went through all of the different stages and looked at the different areas. There was one area in particular called the silo. Now the silo had riggings for where they would move the lights up to the higher area so they could beam them down onto the stage. Well, this place called the silo, we were in there doing an EVP session. Now, with an EVP session, I'm sure that you're familiar with, it's electric, electromagnet, or electric voice phenomenon. And we would ask the entity, if we employ psychics on the team, that would be able to communicate with them. And one of our psychics said that they had made contact with an entity and they were in the silo area. So we set up the EVP session and we would ask the question, leave enough enough time for the entity to to respond and then go back and review that recording. So we're going through the EVP session and the psychic is there and making contact with the entity that was in the room or in the silo area. I wouldn't say it was really a room, it was just a circular area with ladders. And the question was asked, what is it that you can do now that you've passed over to the non-living that you cannot do when you were alive? And there was a silence, and there was probably in that area about 
I'd say about six, seven people in there. And silence after the question. And the psychic goes, bathroom. He says he can go into the women's bathroom. And the two ladies that had invited our group into the theater to investigate, they gasp. And it was like, Ugh! And so we're like, oh, obviously we've hit upon something. So we went through the investigation, and, and afterwards we're doing the debriefing. And that's where we actually sit down with the people that are invited us into the home or to, into the building to see what exactly has been going on and whether any of our findings support what has been going on. So we get to this EVP session, and it was brought up, okay, this was the question that was asked. What could he, this entity do now that he could not do when he was alive? And the psychic said, I heard the name, the word bathroom, and that he could go into the women's bathroom. And the girls proceeded to tell us that the women's bathroom in this particular theater was haunted. And they would often see a man standing in the peripheral vision, and when they turned their head, he'd be gone. Or if they were in the stall, the bathroom door would actually shake. The stall door would shake. And it was often cold in there, or they would walk in, and there would be absolutely nobody in the bathroom at that time. And the stalls would actually be locked. And someone would have to crawl under on the bathroom floor into the stall to be able to unlatch it. And we were like, wow, it's, that's amazing that the psychic got this. Well, there was even further proof that there was additional entity human interaction going on. When the EVP came back, you hear the question being asked about the bathroom, you hear a silence, and then in a very clear male voice, you hear bathroom a whisper of a man's voice saying bathroom blew the entire group away. It was incredible. It's the most legitimate proof that we've ever established with that group that there was an interaction between the living and the non-living world. So yeah, it's, it's paranormal investigating. It's oftentimes for a lot of people, it's scary. I go into it with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of fun, and I, I find it very amazing. And yeah, there's been times where I've, I've seen full body apparitions and I've had doors and things thrown at me and it's like, wow, this is kind of intense. So yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun, and just want to thank you guys for your great podcast. I'm loving it. I'm um, sharing it with my community, uh, with the Bear with Me, which is my podcast and my paranormal friends. So keep up the great work, and if you like my story, I'll definitely uh, call back in and tell you all kinds. I spent seven years working at Walt Disney World, so I have lots of Mickey hauntings that I can tell you about. So have a great day, and big bear hugs from Bear Elliot. I'd love to hear more of the uh, the Disney hauntings. Oh, yeah, especially yeah. with our uh, family-friendly episode we're going to do in October. That would yeah. be great. Yeah, so please do call back in. Please continue to share your stories. It sounds like you have multiple calls worth of them. So when it uh, when the mood strikes you, feel free to uh, call up and, uh, and leave us a story. Uh, I got the feeling he was in some sort of broadcasting, the way that he was. You just tell. You yeah. can tell. Just the way that someone holds themselves or delivers themselves. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would love to hear more. So please do, uh, please do share that with us. Very interesting story. You know, 30 hours that he listens sounds like a lot, uh -huh. but we just figured that up and did the math uh -huh. and you can listen to our show for 16 days straight. <laughs> if you went not... to like every episode yeah. and Andy PP. Yeah. Wow. 16 days straight. It's <laughs> a lot of listening. That's a lot. I get sick of us doing that. You know, if, if, uh, you know, if, if I wasn't the one here, that was has already listened to all of these stories. Mm -hmm. If I was just a listener out there and say I had a limited amount of time left and I knew it, uh, I would I'd be all about it. I'd be like, if I'm bedridden or something and I can't go anywhere, I'd be like, turn it on. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just gonna sit there and listen because it, it to me, you know, it's one of those things. I, it's so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I, I love listening to ghost stories, and I used to binge on whatever I could find out there, which was we were limited, you know, pretty much to. You know, there's a, a couple podcasts, but um, like in the style of this, there's not a whole lot. Um, I was just listening to the old ghost to ghosts and, yeah. you know, there's only so many of those that existed. So, yeah, I, I think we've 
succeeded on the mission of creating a lot of content like this. I think we have. <laughs> and it's not ending anytime soon. So, uh, so there you go. Thank you for calling in and sharing your story. And uh, we really do appreciate that. The phone number 855-853-4802 is uh, the way you can uh, share your real ghost story with us, of course, on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. And don't miss those uh, EPP episodes. Lots of great content in there. So uh, check that out to sign up at uh, realghoststoriesonline.com. It's only $5 a month. That's what keeps our show on the air. You are supportive of it by being an EPP. So there you go. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.